the first item on the agenda are, are there any bill introductions this morning? All right, seeing none. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday when we adjourned uh, the committee meeting, uh, today is going to be Energy Day uh, in appropriations. And so the first, um, I guess, conferee that we have is going to be Ed Cross with the President and Chief Operations Officer with the Kansas Independent Oil and Gas Association, also referred to as Cuyahoga, uh, to talk about one of the major industries uh, in the state of Kansas. So, Mr. Cross, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody, and, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. As you said, I'm Edward Cross, uh, president of the Kansas Independent Oil and Gas Association, and I want to thank the opportunity today to, to talk a little bit and share about the oil and gas industry and some of the, uh, the uh, concerns and, and challenges that we have, as well as our opportunities uh, out there. So, you know, one of the things, uh, it is my honor and privilege to serve this great industry of small independent oil and gas producers. And uh, I'm very lucky to be able to do the things I'd like to do, but I'm also even more lucky to get to work with the men and women that make up this great industry. And, and so, you know, when you look at our members, we account for 92% of the oil and gas produced in Kansas. And with nearly 3,000 members across the state, we are the lead state and national advocate for the Kansas independent oil and gas industry. Also today, uh, behind me out here in the crowd is Kevin Gregg. He represents the Eastern Kansas Oil and Gas Association. And we have Matt Hickam that represents the American Petroleum Institute uh, right here. So uh, you guys have a big packet of information that I put together on a number of different issues, our policy agenda, as well as our strategic analysis, state of the oil and gas industry. Uh, you can read those, but uh, my comments are based upon those, and, and, uh, uh, but those go in much more detail. So I want to just begin by looking at some of the crude oil market dynamics that are going on. And while the U.S. and Kansas economies have continued to recover from the worst of the coronavirus, there are significant concerns out there that exist, uh, including high inflation, volatility in energy markets, U.S. trade and foreign policies, and more. Inflation is a staggering 14 percent of the last two years, and real wages have fallen 4 percent, and the stock market is down 16 percent. And most destructive for the economy has been the historical federal spending spree. You know, over the last two years, federal government have added $4.8 trillion in new spending, which the Federal Reserve said was the main inflation contributor. So when you look at global oil prices, you know, they retreated in late 2022 uh, as the outlook for energy con consumption deteriorated. And analysts project energy consumption declines with the on uh, onset of the business cycle slowdown and recession. So we may see some of that in the future. The explosive cyclical upswing in both the economy and the oil uh, and prices that began after the first wave of the coronavirus and the lockdowns in the second quarter of 2020, that peaked in the second quarter of 2022. Since then, uh, we've seen the economic deceleration in, in oil consumption. Global oil and energy consumption has been following, uh, falling since the third quarter of 2022 uh, under the impact of high prices and slowing economy. Uh, but that was initially masked by concerns about a planned introduction of the price cap on Russia's crude and refined products exports. Analysts anticipated, uh, excuse me, <coughs> Analysts anticipated uh, Russia's response to the price cap would be to cut their production by more than the economic slowdown would cut consumption. And so fears about that kept prices elevated, even in, in increased in late September and October of last year, despite increasingly poor outlook for the economy. So whenever that uh, uh, underlying deterioration in consumption was unmasked, it led to a sharp drop in oil prices. Oil prices dropped about 20 percent at the end of 2022. 20, uh, and so that's kind of where we're at today, at least on oil prices. And I'll talk a little more in a minute. But when I talk about we represent the independent oil and gas producers, we're the small businesses that drill and produce oil and natural gas from the earth here in Kansas. We don't uh, generate or market the end products. We sell those to uh, purchasers. So the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission, they define a marginal well as a well that makes 10 barrels of oil per day or less, or less uh, 60,000 cubic feet of natural gas per day or less. Uh, and the independents here, we drill and, and, and produce those kinds of wells. Uh, and you know, we raise our capital through our wellhead. We're not tapping equity markets. So the cash flow that we get from a well is what we use to drill more wells or put more wells uh, uh, on, on pump. Uh, most Kansas producers live and work right here in Kansas and friends and neighbors, everyone here. Every $1 million of CapEx, this is from a study that we did last year, 
Uh, every $1 million of CapEx for independence results in $1.1 million of total taxes generated along with the creation of 39 jobs. Every $1 million of CapEx for independence results in $2.4 million of direct and $5.1 million of overall contribution to gross domestic product. So in 2022, the Kansas oil and gas ener energy generated $3.6 billion in output and supported over 100,000 jobs across Kansas and $3 billion in family income. It's an important part of the Kansas economy and a critical part going forward. When you look at where it's produced, it's produced in 89 of the 105 counties, so we're across the entire state. And uh, we're always consistently in, in one of the top industries in terms of gross state product. Uh, in 2022, 70 percent or 76% of the value of the oil and gas industry came from oil production, 24% from natural gas production. So you heard me say that the IOGCC classified a marginal well as 10 barrels of oil per day or less. In Kansas, our average well makes two barrels of oil per day, and our average natural gas well makes 23,000 cubic feet of gas, where, you know, defined for natural gas is 60,000 or less. We make 23,000 uh, on average, but yet we're, we're, we're uh, producing 3.6 billion in industry output. Direct employment in the Kansas oil and gas industry is roughly about 13,800 folks. They're paid $940 million for an average wage of nearly 60,000 per year. And in areas where oil and gas are found, industry represents a quarter of the jobs in some counties and 60 to 70 percent of property tax. Uh, when you look at oil production in Kansas during 2022, 2022 it was over 28 million barrels, and that's up 1.9 percent. And so that uh, should indicate how much activity is going on. We have roughly 40,000 oil wells out there, and they naturally dec decline by 11, 12 percent per year. So just to see the state's production uh, stay steady would mean a lot of activity, meaning you're trying to replace those, uh, that declining production. But we saw an increase last year of 1.9 percent. Uh, However, you know, we look at the, the Kansas production, though, so we go back to the years when, we're, when uh, the prices were higher for a period. In 2014, uh, our production is 43 percent lower than what it was in, in 2014. So that has uh, also affects tax, uh, tax collections here in Kansas. Uh, tax collections in the state of Kansas and Kansas counties will increase in calendar year 2022. Estimated Kansas will collect $38.6 million more dollars in um, severance taxes and five million more in ad valorem tax receipts in 2022 versus 2021. I'm talking about calendar year uh, on those, and and but uh, severance tax receipts still remain about 46 percent below where they were in 2014. Ad valorem tax receipts are 53 percent below 2014 collections. When you look at activity in the Kansas oil and gas industry in 2022. The KCC issued 1,681 drilling permits in 2022. That's a 30% increase over 2021. And what's, what's very interesting about that is that the number of oil and gas drilling permits issued in Kansas in 2022 was second in the nation only to Texas. Uh, so, so, you know, now Texas has much different type of wells than what we, that we drill down the Permian Basin, but it should, uh, yeah, it shows, and not that we drilled every one of those permits either, but, but uh, it, there was a, a number of permits that were issued uh, on that. So what, you know, since the fallout from the COVID-19, you know, when crude oil prices were down and that, that affected COVID-19 affected everybody in the, con in the economy. And in, in the oil and gas industry, there was nearly 5,000 wells were shut down in Kansas in 2020. And, you know, and that experienced over $810 million in lost oil output. So they've been working, Kansas producers have been working in 2021 and 2022 uh, to improve their operational efficiencies and refocus their CapEx on, uh, on the most, on short cycle projects. And that's where a lot of this activity has been going on is, is recovery uh, from that. In Kansas, improved productivity is less about improved technology and more about better application of existing technology. So I look at 2023, the energy outlook remains subject to heightened levels of uncertainty. You know, after a tumultuous 2020, Kansas uh, uh, oil prices averaged $29.79 a barrel in 2020. That's, that's uh, below what most of them, uh, break even point could, could do that. As a matter of fact, in 2020, there was even a time there was negative crude oil prices. They, uh, prices began a slow recovery in 2021 and 2022 as the economy began to recover. In 2021, our average crude oil price was $57.77 a barrel. And last year in 2022 was $84.63 a barrel. 
So ongoing concerns about the global economic conditions, increased uncertainty in the market, and you know, we expect more global oil production and consumption, uh, which would put downward pressure on oil prices. So the Energy Information Administration's short-term energy outlook, the latest one, which was on January 10th, it projects Kansas crude oil prices to average about $68 a barrel in 2023 versus the $84, $85 that we received in 2022. So that's down about 19% from last year. Um, last time I checked, the posted price here in Kansas for Kansas crude oil is $68.25 a barrel. Uh, so it looks like at least EIA comes out with a projection every month, uh, so they may change that, but at least from the last projection, it looks like uh, we're at about what they think the average will be. So, the, you know, the prevailing view that the energy transition is a linear trajectory from oil and other fossil fuels to renewables is misleading uh, to a world because the world is thirsty for energy, and that includes all forms of energy, and uh, oil and gas will play an important part of that. Uh, to place the expected future energy demand in some context, the 2022 World Energy Outlook study uh, sees the need to annually add an average of 2.7 million barrels of oil equivalent per day in the period between now and 2045. From 2021 to 2045, total world energy demand is expected to increase by 23%, and population is the biggest uh, uh, driver uh, in that, uh, in that increase in demand. You know, because more people will need more fuel. Oil's share, this is from the study, where oil's share of total energy in 2045 will decline from 30.9% today to 28.6%. Coal will fall further from 26.1% to 16.6%. Natural gas will rise as will nuclear, hydro, and biomass. And the biggest growth area will be renewables, which will go f grow from 2.6% in 2021 to 10.9% by the year 2045. Uh, so, you know, fossil fuels are still going to be an important part of energy mix in 2045. So despite aspirational policies attempting to define a transition away from fossil fuels, actions actually speak louder than words. Countries are showing every day that they're more interested in affordable energy than paying a premium, green premium. And that's proving particularly true in light of energy price crisis uh, whether considering China's interest in buying uh, Russian oil or Germany's decision to hold on to coal. So you need to believe what you see, not necessarily what you hear. Germany and California have shown that alternative energy is really supplemental energy. Uh, let me uh, turn my focus now on, uh, I'll skip that part, and go over here to some of the key challenges and opportunities that we have in the Kansas oil and gas industry. One of those is energy policy, and particularly national energy policy. You know, we engage national uh, congressional members, our own congressional delegation, as well as many others on energy issues. So uh, policymakers at the federal level are expected to work to find a compromise in the area of energy policy. During times of economic recession and recovery, the public's priorities revolve around improving the economy, and this extends to energy legislation. According to some uh, surveys, and these are in your packet, the U.S. public wants Congress to provide energy legislation that will help bolster the economy, protect the environment, and require very minimal personal sacrifice by the consumer. So we can, so you, we can expect the 118th Congress to uh, propose energy initiatives that not only promote renewable energy, but protect the economic benefits currently provided by fossil fuels. So the, the, the public from this survey primarily sees energy policy uh, and actually, I, I say two, but there's really three. They view it as an economic issue, an environmental issue, and some identify it as a national security issue. And so, you know, uh, it depends on how they, how they view that. Uh, that creates a challenge for the 118th Congress to, to be able to mediate or, or to mediate these opposing viewpoints to create policy that is beneficial to the economy and the environment. The most pressing issues facing the U.S. economy in the foreseeable future are not those arising from climate change or energy transition. Rather, the factors to watch are inflation, rising energy costs, and national security threats. Uh, so the public is divided on whether energy policy is an economic or an environmental issue, but they want a strong economy while improving environmental standards, and we can expect Congress to try to achieve that outcome. You know, many folks across the nation are not financially secure enough to deal with rising energy costs and are unwilling to make significant changes in their lifestyles. So both Republicans and Democrats will need to work together to improve energy policy, and this will be, uh, will be difficult. Uh, if energy policy does not serve the best interest of the public, then it offers no incentives for the public to make significant changes in their lifestyle. 
Uh, so uh, that's the challenge that they have at the federal level, and we're get engaging on those energy policy challenges. Some of the po uh, issues that affect us here in Kansas as well as is emissions. Uh, you know, just a few years ago, no one would imagine the U.S. could increase production of oil and natural gas while cutting greenhouse gas emissions, which are now near 25-year lows. According to the EPA, the U.S. emitted 14 percent fewer energy-related carbon emissions in 2019 than 2005. Methane emissions are down 14 percent. The EPA came out with a supplemental uh, proposed methane emissions rule in November of 2022, uh, and you know we we have has some problems with that, and we're going to be challenging that. Uh, it seems that it is contrary to the congressional intent of the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which exempts some of the smaller producers. So when they first came out in November 2021, the EPA said that, uh, you know, we want emissions from uh, wells to be less than three tons per year. U.S. Department of Energy did a third-party study of marginal wells, uh, and, and that just came out in 2022, in May of 2022. And they found that wells that make less than six barrels of oil per day equivalent uh, emit less than three tons per year. So we told the EPA then that what, that sh what they should do is come out with, you know, following the Inflation Reduction Act and also uh, going to, according to that study, wells making six barrel oil equivalent per day or less should be exempt from those rules. Uh, they came out in November 2022 deciding not to follow the DOE study, but uh, some of the, of the stuff that the Environmental Defense Fund and other environmental activists did and decided to uh, include all wells, including marginal wells, in their, in their uh, regulations. So we'll be, we'll be challenging some of those things uh, going forward. Uh, another big challenge for us here in Kansas is the lesser prairie chicken. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service listed that uh, uh, as threatened species in Kansas. It was, it was listed as endangered in, uh, the, in West Texas and eastern New Mexico. Originally, it was going to be effective January 24th, and they pushed that back to March the 27th. And we have long advocated that the best scientific and commercial information available demonstrates that the lesser prairie chicken does not meet the Endangered Species Act's definitions of either threatened or endangered. And uh, uh, we'll be challenging that also. Uh, you know, it, it basically, uh, it, uh, it comes down to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service have violated their own procedures on that, and there's really no basis for the action. Uh, we also have others. Waters of the U.S. is another one that will likely be challenged uh, with the EPA on that. We also have another issue is the ESG issues where activists are increasingly setting their sights on the financial sector and legal system and not Congress for pushing their aggressive climate agenda. And so they want to use non-legislative ways to impose perceived climate costs and raise the price of energy. And ESG, or environmental social uh, governance standards, is one of the ways that they're, that they're doing that. And, and from Cuyahoga, from our standpoint, you know, we believe financial institutions should award financing based on an unbiased, non-political basis. Uh, we're not asking, oil and gas companies are not asking for special treatment. We're just simply asking for financial institutions to be unbiased in their assessments. Now I want to just turn quickly to some state level uh, uh, challenges that we have. And, and like many industries, labor challenges is a big, uh, big issue for us. A tight labor market makes it difficult to find qualified workers, and that's, that's caused by demographic changes. You know, baby boomers are, are exiting the market. We have an uh, overly heated economy there where increased competition among employers for the same employees and friction within the labor market that's needed to uh, train new employees on new processes on all of that. So uh, I told you how much the activity had increased in Kansas over the last year. You know, we had anywhere from uh, uh, 45 to 60 drilling rigs running, but we could have done more if they could have, had, uh, they could have found more people and more equipment on that. And, and, you know, and so that's a, that's a big challenge. Uh, another challenge is, you know, I know it's been talked about is the Kansas Corporation Commission. You know, environmentally responsible oil and gas production requires good and effective regulation. And at the association, we believe in the state regulatory process, and we think the KCC does a good job regulating the oil and gas industry. I am an associate representative of the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission and attend all their meetings, and I can tell you from firsthand experience that many states look at the KCC as a model for oil and gas uh, regulation. It is good that K uh, KCC commissions, commissioners are appointed rather than elected. Other states that have elected commissions, commissioners have seen those commissioners favor policies that prioritize their donors, denying everyday citizens the opportunity to have their voices heard. Another big challenge for us is electric rates, and we need to find 
uh, solutions for the high electric rates. I think we all want to see lower electric rates. Uh, we have uh, some of the highest electric rates in the region. And for uh, oil and gas operators, electric costs are 30 to 50 percent of an oil well's expense. So these are important for us. And we support studies and, 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 uh, on how we can be more competitive in those electric rates and look forward to participating in discussions on how to address those. Carbon capture is also another challenge for the industry. You know, in the past we've looked at, you know, there's been some real uh, uh, issues for the oil and gas industry with carbon capture, you know, especially before some of the issues of uh, condemnation were addressed. Those things to be addressed now, but there's still a number of risks and costs associated with carbon capture uh, that, uh, that operators are concerned about. And we're working with the other groups that are looking at those at that bill, uh, bill that on carbon capture to try to address some of those because most operators would not accept carbon dioxide in, in their oil and gas fields uh, with these significant OPEX and CAPEX risks that goes along with that. So a class six well in, in carbon capture would take about two years to get a permit. It'd take about two years to get the equipment. So it'd be at least four years before you could uh, get a well and it'd be uh, significantly expensive uh, to do that. I know we've had some operators try to get some of those before. Uh, just as I wind down here, I just want to look at what powers the U.S. today, and this is from the Energy Information Administration. Uh, today, uh, in 2022, oil provided 36 percent of our energy consumption, natural gas 32 percent, coal 11 percent, and wind and solar provided 5 percent. So 79 percent of our energy consumption in the United States is fossil fuels. And when you look at it at the global level, what will power our, our, our world in the future? The Energy Information Administration estimates that by 2045, world energy demand will increase by 23 percent, and 69 percent of that demand will be supplied by fossil fuels. 50 percent of that in 2045 will be supplied by oil and gas. Renewable energy sources are projected to grow significantly, providing 10.9 percent of global energy needs by the year 2045. So, you know, while some of the ambitious pledges from some of the various international bodies and governments would suggest that the energy transition is near, uh, the gap between theory and reality is vast. Fossil fuels supplied 82 percent of global energy needs in 2021, and it will likely be decades before an energy transition can take place. So the energy transition may have begun, but we're a long way before fossil fuel dominance is truly challenged. So let, let me close by saying that the oil and gas industry shares an energy future vision with the public. We and our families live and work right here in Kansas, and we care as much as anyone about people's needs and concerns and the environment, and we take these issues very seriously. So our mission is to empower people, improve lives, and inspire success. And uh, I would say thank you and, and stand for questions or comments. All right. Thank you, Mr. Cross, for giving us an update on the oil and gas industry in the state of Kansas. And if I recall, the state of Kansas is the 11th largest oil producing state in the nation. Is that correct? It is. You know, so, sometimes we move into the top 10, depends on what some of the other states do. I think we're like 14th or 15th in uh, natural gas production. So we're still, uh, when you say 11th, actually uh, we would be 10th if you, if federal offshore is one of those. So they'll count that as one of those states as federal offshore, but then uh, that produces more. I just kind of want to point out how important it is to the Kansas economy that uh, we have absolutely. the oil and gas industry in the state. Mm -hmm. um, you had mentioned in your comments that production or drilling production had increased uh, by 30% over 2021 and, and 2022. Um, where in the, in the state are you seeing most of the drilling production going on? Okay. Uh, that was a 30% increase in drilling permits, not necessarily a 30% uh, uh, increase in production. I think 1.9% uh, was our production. But what most operators are doing right now is they're going into the fields that they have, and they had those many wells that were shut down during the COVID when times are down, and they're trying to get many of those on and then also drill uh, you know, low-risk sites within their own, uh, uh, their own fields. So as far as exploration production or EMP, uh, going out looking for new reserves. There may be some of that, but that's not really the, the main part of the activity right now. It's really just dr infield drilling and, and, uh, and catching up from when uh, the things were down now. So it is spread across the, the, the state, but uh, you know, we anticipate that there would be more drilling uh, in this coming year. And talking about uh, drilling, um, obviously when you have a drilling rig on a lease, it's a 24-7 operation um, drilling that well. Mm -hmm. And you talked about workforce. Mm -hmm. And so obviously that's going to be, um, it's going to be impacting 
uh, the drilling that's going to go on in the state of Kansas if they're not able to find enough uh, employees for a 24-7 uh, drilling rig. That's absolutely true. I mean, that was last year that there, there was companies that have drilling rigs as well as well service units or cementing uh, trucks. They have more equipment in the yard that could do that. They just don't have anyone to run that. So uh, uh, oil and gas producers and operators have to wait for those services. They can call up a company and say, I want to do this. I want to drill a well, and they'll put, put on a wait list. I talked to a guy uh, just earlier, th well, in January, a few weeks ago, that got on a list, and he thinks he's going to get the drilling rig. He's excited. He's going to get it in May. You know, because the, it isn't because the company doesn't have drill, drilling rigs, they just don't have the people to operate those. I talked to another guy that has uh, well service units, uh, things that go out and pull wells and, and repair those wells. He was looking for uh, folks in western Kansas uh, uh, to try to hire. Uh, his only requirement is they have a GED and pass a drug test, pays $24 an hour, provides uh, full insurance coverage for the employee and, and their uh, wife. Uh, can't find anyone take that you know so it's a you know number of reasons for that and you, you know but uh, it, it, it would seem like for that would be a pretty good position to have but uh, that's uh, an oil and gas industry but I'm not trying to suggest that we're the only ones having those problems but because I think every industry is but you know it's just difficult to find those right now well and I know on the like you said in every industry we're having workforce issues and i just wanted to see how that was impacting the oil and gas industry um how much has uh, in the last 10 years has the hugenton wells declined in production yes that hugenton field of course is it used to be one of the if not the largest natural gas field in the world back in the 1920s and 30s but and it's been declining ever since and, and right now it has declined quite a bit it used to be major oil companies in there and they're starting to get out now we have some large uh, publicly traded even uh, independents that are in there that are starting to get out and the smaller independents are starting to come in so the Hugenton field has been declining our, our natural gas production in the state's been declining significantly you know over the last several years this last year it declined by three percent and and in 2021 it declined by six percent so the the, the, the diminished law of diminishing returns it's declining less than what it was the year before which is significant because there is some some drilling going on there that, that's that's causing natural gas production to stem the decline but it had you know it was declining by 16 to 20 percent in many of those years before that so it continues to decline and as it does those larger companies will uh, you have higher overhead costs will leave and, and a lot of independents or, or smaller uh, companies are moving in to, to try to take some of those uh, properties and it might be a little early um, for you to answer this but i know a couple of years ago uh, this committee um, actually worked on the combination of the two um, oil well, oil and gas abandoned well funds mm -hmm. and put that into one fund to help with the abandoned wells across the state of Kansas. Um, how has that been working, one? And two, how many abandoned wells do we have in the state of Kansas? And then three, there's also federal money that's going to be coming in or has come in to address the abandoned well issue in the state of Kansas. Okay. Help me remember all three of those questions. I'll try to start with the, uh, the, uh, the first one. We did combine uh, those uh, two plugging funds, uh, which was something that, that, that we advocated for as well. The KCC, uh, b before they had two plugging funds, one was for wells that were drilled before 1996 that were abandoned with no, no responsible operator you know, that the state had. And the other fund was for wells drilled after 1996. And what we found was the wells that were drilled after 1996 that were abandoned with no responsible operator. I think they plugged one or two wells uh, since that time when they couldn't find the operator. And so most of the wells were in the ones bef that were drilled before 1996. So we had a, a fund that was, uh, that was growing and not being used. And then the other one was, was uh, plugging a lot of wells. So, so we agreed uh, with the KCC and, and, and the, the, the committee here that combining those two funds were in the best interest, uh, you know, so that we could just plug abandoned wells regardless of when they were drilled as long as, you know, if we couldn't find a responsible operator. I don't know how many of those have been plugged. Uh, is that the second question? How many? How many abandoned wells do we have in the Oh, state? abandoned wells, yes. And I, I'm sorry, I didn't look up that, that number with the KCC uh, uh, before today's hearing. I didn't anticipate that question. But, but uh, th there's thousands of those uh, out there that, that still need, and I know they are uh, uh, working to try to get those uh, plugged as, as efficiently and fast as possible using that. The third is the federal money on that. And, and so uh, 
the federal money that they got, it was a regrow act that they passed that would allow uh, uh, the federal government to provi uh, provide funds to plug abandoned wells throughout, uh, throughout the nation. So they had to make application for that money. <clears throat> when they passed the regrow act, and, and this is another challenge for us, and we, we may be uh, uh, challenging uh, the federal government on this. When they passed the regrow act, they said there would be no strings attached to that, 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 that you would be plugging abandoned wells. Uh, since that time, Department of U.S. Department of Interior started attaching strings, like like uh, like requiring them to uh, to adhere to the Bacon Davis Act. In other words, pay prevailing wage, uh, for example, on 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 plugging those wells, as well as imposing uh, methane regulations that are still under review at the at the federal level. Uh, so so you know we question whether or not. Uh, uh, there should be strings attached to that money whenever, whenever they're going there. So we'll see how that goes. I, I know they're going to have, they're, they're struggling to find, you know, how, how they're going to get companies to to uh, adhere to all of those federal requirements to to do that, and, and that's still a challenge I think today that they're working on. All right, thank you, Representative Corbett. Thank you, Chairman. And I've got a constituent that uh, when I knew, when I knew you were coming. He kind of told me that, like on January the first, they set the price of your oil for the rest of the year, and somehow what your production is on January first is what they tax you for the rest of the year. Is any of that true? Mr. Okay, Cross? so so you're talking about the the uh, Department of, of uh, Revenue's Property Valuation Division. They come out with an oil and gas appraisal guide, and they actually just came out with that last night. And so, uh, so they uh, uh, they look at what we what they project oil prices to be in uh, 20, 2023, so that we have to file uh, uh, renditions with each of the counties uh, between now and the 1st of April, and, and they have to do that. So, you know, we, they uh, consult many sources on oil prices, including Cuyahoga. We met with them and gave them our, our $68, uh, you know, and so there's others that would say, oh, no, it's going to be higher or lower, what have you. But, uh, you know, so they set the price. Yeah, I got that last night, $70 for 2023 is what they set the price for uh, oil production for the, the coming year. So every year we meet with them and they come out with a price. And some, you know, it's impossible to project what anybody can project what the exact price is going to be the coming year. Uh, so last year, the, the price was $68 and our average price was $86. So in that particular year, Maybe the the industry benefited from that price. Other years they'll set it. You know, if it's set at seventy dollars this year, and our average price was sixty, then then we're paying more. So so uh, every year we we are usually pretty close uh, whenever we set that price, uh, you, you know, on that. So so and they do listen to what industry has to say on that, and that's something that we work on every year uh, with that. But you are correct; they do set that price. So uh, Representative the, Corbett, and then on production, is it by the month? Or do they set the price for the year? I mean, like if yeah. some some months you have a great month and some months your wells broke down, mm -hmm. how does that work? Yes, it's not based upon the production; it's the price. You have to fill out your renditions every, every at, at the year, and at the end of the year, you can you you can uh, uh, oppose those what they come out with and and go to the board of tax appeals and and. Uh, uh, you know, get money back or, or something like that. So it's not based on your production. It's not January 1st production and they just put it for the rest of the year. You put on there uh, exactly what you did during the year. Uh, so. Thank you, Representative Hoffman. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ed, thanks for being here. I uh, appreciate your what you were saying about the transition. I always say that the energy transition is more like a shuffle. Uh, it's really not a transition because we're, we're, we're going to have oil and gas, fossil fuels for, I'd say, 100 years still. And so I think it's more like a, just a shuffling of the, uh, of the uh, different energy sources. But um, going back to your talk about drilling here in Kansas, uh, are the producers, are they, because of the uncertainty and everything, and are, are they going out and leasing property, or are they just pretty well staying where, where they already have leased property? Mr. Cross? Yes, uh, you know the drilling and activity right now is in their core areas. So the areas that they have the, the, the most knowledge about, and, and they have some operations going on there. There is probably some leasing going on because there are some companies that, through the COVID, uh, you know, greatly struggled and, cha and were challenged, and they're looking to get 
maybe uh, you know, divest of some of their properties. And so some of them will not only buy the properties, but maybe lease some uh, out there. So there is some leasing going on. I wouldn't say it's, it's, it's really hot right now, but most of the activity is uh, you know, recovery activities within their own properties. Okay, that's why I was figured it probably wasn't mm -hmm. much. Much of uh, going out past where they, they know there's something maybe there. So. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Helgerson. Mr. Cross, thank you very much. Um, you mentioned one item that I wanted to zero in a little bit, and that was uh, electricity and uh, electrical costs. Uh, Three-part question. Uh, can you tell us how significant those costs are compared with your bottom line? Can you tell me, have you done any comparison with other states, how our electrical rates compare with them? And third, especially since it's following, have you, has the industry moved to using wind energy in order to deal with some of the issues that you have? It seems like it would be a great fit. Okay. Mr. Cross. Yeah. Thank you for the questions. Okay. So, so it, it, and maybe I hopefully I mentioned it earlier, but the electricity cost is, is one of the major costs of an oil and gas well. Uh, you know, so anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of the cost of, of uh, of uh, operating an oil and gas well is electricity costs. So that is a big bottom line driver for, uh, uh, for, for our oil wells. And most of our electric rate issues deal more with co-ops than it does with utilities. We're not really getting, most of our oil operations are out in rural Kansas, so they're getting it from the co-ops. So, so uh, you know, uh, we definitely, you know, we, we look at different ways that that, that could help you know, because if, um, if uh, electric rates are so high that it causes an oil and gas operator to shut down a well and plug it. Uh, so I'll give, you, I'll give you one example of an operator that had a well that made three barrels of oil per day and 300 barrels of water. And uh, it, it, that the well is profitable, uh, except whenever, you know, oil prices go really low, not like they did in 2020 and 2021. Then, it, then it's not profitable anymore. So he was paying $10,000 a month for electricity for that well. Uh, so, so he would go to the electric co-op and say, you know, I'm going to have to plug that well if, if we can't do something about the rate. So perhaps there's a low, low price rider or something on there that says when oil goes below a certain level, we'll, you know, we'll reduce your electric rate by 30% or something until it goes back above a certain level. Because if you plug that well, that means that's 120000 that the co-op's not getting that they would have to spread their fixed costs over the, re the remaining uh, rate payers. And it just puts more pressure on those. So, I mean, those are things that we talk about to, to uh, uh, the co-ops and others out there. And what was your next question? I, I, I didn't write it down. Representative Helgerson. Comparisons with other oh. states. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the final point is, with wind energy, uh, have you had much success uh, in using it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, good. No, so other states, you know, we have operators that also operate in other states. And, and a lot of them operate in Oklahoma. And they find, they find you know, uh, we're in Kansas, they're paying 10 to 11 cents. Uh, they're paying six to eight cents in Oklahoma. And so, so the, you know, that, that's part of when, when we say electric rate issues, we'll look at other states too, even with the uh, uh, Kansas oil wells that have them in other states. And, and so, you know, that's what the operators will say. If I had this well in, in Oklahoma, it would pump a lot longer and provide more tax dollars and everything than it will if, it, if it's in Kansas because of those electric rates. Uh, so that is the problem. And when you look at wind energy, I know that, that I, don't, I don't know if a lot of operators are using wind energy, but some are using some of the solar panels to help power the, uh, the, the uh, electric wells, uh, electric motors on the wells. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, you know, and, and you know, back to Representative Hoffman's point, we, we believe in all forms of energy. We, you know, we, we uh, fossil fuels are needed in the future. But, you know, there's no one source of energy that says this is all we need. We don't need anything else. We, we, we support all forms of energy. Any further questions for Mr. Cross? All right, seeing none. Uh, I just wanted to ask, largest oil producing county in the state, is it still Ellis County? Yes, it is. That's yes. what I thought. Uh, yeah. yes, Representative Rogers is very happy that he has that. the largest oil with producing that. county. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ed, for being right. here and giving us an update on the uh, oil and gas industry in the state of Kansas. Next, we're going to move on to Kevin Gregg, and he is with uh, government, Governmental Relations with the Eastern Kansas Oil and Gas Association, also referred to as ECOGA. Um, so, Kevin, welcome to committee. 
and members of the committee, uh, pleasure to be here. And uh, it's a hard act to follow. Ed uh, gives a pretty comprehensive overview of the industry. Uh, I am Kevin Gregg, and I represent ECOGA, which is the Eastern Kansas Oil and Gas Association. Uh, we were founded in 1956, and we were established to provide a voice to the Eastern Kansas oil and gas producers uh, because we do have a little bit of a, a different uh, strategy. Uh, on how we produce oil and gas. Um, we currently have about 200 members, and as far as hydrocarbon production, eastern Kansas is typically defined as the counties in the east ranges. The sixth principal meridian divides Sedgwick County from north to south, and those it passes through Wichita on Meridian Avenue, and the counties east of this line uh, have eastern ranges in accordance with the rectangular survey system. Uh, oil production in eastern Kansas is typically from very shallow carbonate and sandstone reservoirs. Uh, these productive zones can be less than 200 feet deep in far eastern Kansas and nearly 3,000 feet closer to Wichita. Those formations get deeper the farther west you go. Uh, most of the gas production in eastern Kansas by volume is from coal formations in the southeastern part of the state, and these wells are referred to as coal bed methane wells. Natural gas production infrastructure is pretty poor outside of that, that core area. Uh, geological and reservoir conditions dictate that individual wells generally aren't as prolific in eastern Kansas, and we our wells typically produce uh, somewhere around a single barrel of oil a day. Uh, the eastern Kansas range is uh, primarily 43 counties. Uh, the, there's 35 of those uh, counties that have commercial oil and gas production. Uh, the leading counties in uh, the eastern Kansas area are Butler, Cowley, Woodson, Greenwood, Allen, Miami, and Coffee, uh, and then we produce gas in 13 of those counties, and the three that lead that are Neosho, Wilson, Montgomery, and Labette, which account for 97% of all gas production for eastern Kansas. Uh, the, there are four counties, uh, five counties that have never produced uh, commercial oil and gas, Cherokee, Donovan, Marshall, uh, Shawnee, and Wabunsee uh, don't have the commercial oil and gas production. Uh, as far as our business model goes, uh, the ECOGA operators are typically small businesses. Um, of the state's 2021 top 50 oil producers, only four have operations focused in eastern Kansas. Most of our operators have a small staff. Uh, it's usually a bookkeeper and a secretary, and they're, they're located in the small rural communities. We don't have uh, engineers, lawyers, geologists on staff. Uh, and many operators have been uh, granted these wells, been passed down for second and third generation family businesses. Uh, oil field jobs uh, are primarily the, the higher paying jobs in those areas, uh, and especially uh, higher paying jobs for folks without a post-secondary education. Uh, we are really, we're in heavy need, just like Ed said, of uh, operators, uh, truck drivers, uh, heavy equipment operators, welders, mechanics, uh, these are all high paying jobs and we just a lot of times can't find people to fill those jobs. Um, the current business risk that we face, um, we again lack of skilled labor. Um, nearly every ECOGA member, probably every ECOGA member is actively trying to find that skilled labor. Uh, the price crash, uh, a lot of those folks were laid off. Uh, some of the wells went out of production, and then uh, once we started to ramp production back up, uh, we just couldn't, uh, couldn't find people to fill those jobs. Uh, we are also facing uh, supply, chain, supply chain constraints and inflation. Uh, like uh, Ed mentioned before, the primary driver of our uh, costs in our business are both uh, labor costs and electricity costs. Electricity costs will... Uh, range anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of the cost of our operations. Our organization focuses on regulations, laws, and tax policy, as well as communicating the role that we play in our state and local economies throughout the state. Uh, given the size of our operations, which are typically pretty small, uh, the additional uh, regulatory paperwork and uh, bureaucratic paperwork that we're required to file is, is burdensome, more so on our small staff. Uh, but we're primarily concerned with the, the taxation that we pay and also trying to avoid some of those burdensome regulations. Uh, we participate in the organization called Kansas Strong. We have two seats on the Kansas Strong board and Kansas Strong, ECOGA, and Cuyahoga all advocate for Kansas oil and production in the state to illustrate the positive economic impact we have on the state. We're highly supportive of STEM education and training for our Kansas students. So we feel like that 
given that we are small operations, uh, we provide good paying jobs and help provide for the energy independence of the state and our nation. Uh, we provide a play a very important part in the economy of our, our nation. So uh, with that, I would uh, stand for questions and uh, be happy to answer any questions the committee had. All right, thank you, Mr. Gregg. And I would say that uh, the first oil well drilled in the state of Kansas was actually in the eastern part of the state before Kansas even became a state. Around what, 1860? Uh, yeah, I would have to. I, I'll defer to your 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 knowledge right. of that. I would say that's how important um, it is for the eastern part of the state because actually they were the one that started the oil production in the state of Kansas. Thank you. Uh, Representative Estes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, do you have any idea, even just a ballpark idea of what regulations are costing your members? It'd be hard to put a number or a percentage on it, but the, the part of the reason that it, it's a, such a burden on our, our, because we're smaller operators and we do have, you know, there might be a, an operator that's trying to uh, go out into the field and take care of issues that are there. And then there's a single secretary in the office and oftentimes the operators that are trying to uh, create a larger margin may not even have a, someone back at the office. So they're out in the field all day and then when they get back, then they're forced to take care of all that paperwork. I would say that it, I, it would be hard to gauge, but I would say somewhere between 30 and 40% of their time is spent with paperwork and filling out uh, just requirements for rules and regulations. Thank you. Representative Ballard. Thank you very much. I enjoyed your presentation and this is probably a very minimal question, but when you say you have 200 members, mm -hmm. Are you referring to individual people who own it or are there partners in it? What constitutes your members? Our members are primarily owner operators since we are, I mean, going back to being small operators, we're owner operators. So it would be someone who owns the company who is responsible for drilling the wells, filing the paperwork. So we have 200 individual companies that make up our, our membership, but most of those companies are either single owner operators or a small staff of under three people normally. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other further questions? Uh, Representative Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so, and, and you're smaller operators, so where does that, where does that oil go? Does it go, re, get refined around El Dorado or, or where? Uh, we, what we produce is normally collected on site on the lease and then it's uh, trucked off to uh, refineries depending on a lot of that uh, would depend on pricing, but most of it does go to local refineries. Okay, and then, and then Mr. Chairman, and then the, the, the quality or the makeup compared to, say, what we do in, in Ellis Rooks County where I am or, say, eastern Kansas, is there a... Is there a big difference? I'm not a big oil guy other than we need it, so. so uh, I think that the there is a difference in pricing. I may defer to Ed on that, but I think there is a difference in pricing between oil that's produced in the western part of the state versus what's produced in the, the eastern part of the state. And there is a, a difference in pricing and the, the value of the, or the price that's paid for oil in the eastern part of the state is slightly lower than what it is in the western part of the state. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any further questions for Mr. Gregg? All right, thank seeing you. none, thank you for being here. And thank you again, Ed, for being here to give us an update on the oil and gas industry. So we're gonna shift gears and move to another energy source. And so I would invite Kimberly Sfati with the Kansas Power Alliance to give us an update on the wind power industry in the state of Kansas. Kimberly. Oh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, I'm really happy to be here before you this morning. And uh, we are, we'll be working off of uh, this slide deck, if that is okay. That's primarily where I'll be speaking from. But then I also um, have provided another handout for you all. And we did, uh, we did this, we published this piece in tandem with the Kansas Geological Survey. And it was part of last year's Geological Survey Field Guide. So I'll also reference this a little bit. But I uh, just wanted to let you know where we were speaking from. Oh, sure, thanks. We'll go ahead and use this guy. So uh, again, my name is Kimberly Genscher Swati, or um, a friend of mine actually captured this from closed captioning in House Energy and Utilities where it said Kimberly Gangster Swati. And since no one can ever pronounce either of my two last names, I know we can remember gangster. 
So we'll kind of go with that. Uh, it led to a big conversation in my family about whether I was more blood or crypt, East Coast, West Coast, um, but it's pretty great. Uh, and then also with me here uh, this morning is uh, Joshua Swati, my business partner, my husband. Uh, he represents kind of whoever I tell him to represent on that particular day. So, <laughs> so we have a lot of fun. But <laughs> in all actuality, uh, it really is a pleasure to get to be here before you representing the advanced power industry. Uh, we are the Kansas Power Alliance, kind of formerly known for a while as the Wind Coalition. But so many of our member companies are involved in the entire energy space that it made so much more sense for us to be called the Advanced Power Alliance rather than just you know specifically the Wind Coalition. So moving to the next slide, this is just a, a basic listing of who our members are. So you can see it's a really diverse group. So these are the largest. Um, energy companies in the world. So if you take the largest, the 20 largest energy companies in the world, 15 of them own and operate um, business assets in the state of Kansas. Uh, we used to have kind of the super majors from an energy standpoint, the super majors being your Exxon's, BP's, Shell's. Um, now the super majors are all are Iberdrola, Nextera, Nextera Energy Resources LLC is as the largest market cap of any company in the world. Um, Enel, EDF, these are all, all major players in the energy space. They're all fully diversified in the energy space. You can also see that we uh, do have several members. The kind of the oil and gas industry has also been members of the Advanced Power Alliance. Currently, Shell is one of our members. Chevron has ebbed and flowed. BP, as they have come in and come out of, of renewables, they were huge into renewables, and then they had the, um, the deep water horizon spill, and so then they sold all of their renewable assets to help pay for that, and then they've gotten back into renewables in a big way. So they've been a member. Um, so we, we do represent kind of the entire the entire gamut of the, the energy space, largely in the advanced power sector. Uh, again, the Kansas Power Alliance specifically, we have more than 40 companies. It's a diverse cross-section of the world's uh, leading energy companies, energy investors, energy consumers, so those uh, what we would call a CNI customer, a commercial and industrial customer, and then energy advocates in the wind, solar, battery storage, hydrogen, and other advanced power spaces. Um, like I said, many of these uh, companies have operating interests in the state of Kansas by way of their renewable assets or clean energy portfolio, projects that are already under agreement or, um, or manufacturing facilities. Uh, our members span the state. They span the, sp the state in both from a ge uh, geographical standpoint, from Kansas City, all the way uh, across the state and, and virtually you know, many, of, many of the counties. We have manufacturing facilities in some of the um, kind of mid-sized communities in the state of Kansas. We're you know, very urban, we're very rural. Um, we are in the communities that have the fastest growing population in the state, and we're also in the communities that have the fastest declining population in the state. Um, so we do truly believe that our investments help all boats rise. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. We also work very, very closely with our community colleges, our technical colleges, and um, our regions institutions. And one thing I always like to point out, and this is something that we should be so proud of, Cloud County Community College is, had the first ever wind turbine technician program in the United States. Iowa likes to say they had the first program, but they had the first building. We actually had the first program. And the Cloud County program has a 100% placement rate from its inception. You start in that Cloud County program, the wind turbine tech program, and you have a job literally upon the day you start in that program. We've actually had to make modifications to the program uh, because it has been a, traditionally a two-year program, but we need folks and we need them trained and we need them in fast. And so we have moved to one-year programs with you know a lot of um, like on-site training. We still have a two-year program for those that want to you know really move up the ranks within the, the company. But you come out of the you come out of those programs and you have a strong strong 401k you know high paying job, and many of those jobs are in our mo more rural portions of the state of Kansas. And so one of the stories that I love to talk about is uh, and we see this replicated over and over and over again. But this particular gentleman and his family they were featured in a Wichita Eagle story about 18 months ago. 
where he wanted to return to the family farm. He was a third, he was third generation, but there was really no financial opportunity for the farm to absorb him and, and, a, and a cost associated with any salary. So he works in the morning at the Diamond Vista wind, for, wind Farm in Marion County. He gets off at three, and then he goes and he works on the family farm, and he is you know, obviously a tremendous value add. So he's literally getting the best of both worlds. And like I said, we do see that story replicated over and over and over and again across the state. Uh, jobs in our industry, we're the fastest growing job, we have the fastest growing jobs um, in the United States, and that is for a wind turbine technician or someone in the solar energy space. And that is projected through at least another several years um, by the Federal Department of Labor. And also we have um, one of the strongest employment rates of veterans in, of, across any industries operating in the United States. So that's something that we're very proud of. And specifically in Kansas, we've taken a lot of the skilled workers um, that may have ebbs and flows related to the aviation industry, and they come into our space, and, and they are highly employable. They're working at Siemens Manufacturing Facility um, and elsewhere in our supply chain on the manufacturing side. So we you know, believe there's been a lot of seamless integration there. Oh, I'm sorry, I have to back up. This is really important. This is so exciting. Uh, the Kid Win Challenge. And several of you uh, had students that participated in this last year. And we have been very, very, very committed to growing our own um, essentially next generation engineers, next generation designers, and then next generation turbine technicians. And so the Kid Win Challenge is a, a program. It's a national program, but, but our state program is, it's the best in the country. And so developers support the Kid Win program here. We have uh, six regional competitions around the state. And so the schools, ages from elementary, largely fourth, fifth, and sixth, middle school, and then high school. And we actually have collegiate win teams as well. And they participate in regional um, competitions. And actually, our, our, our competitions are starting next week. And then the winners of the regional competitions will go to um, the state competition. The winner of the state competition in those three categories go to the national competition. And you guys, last year, Kansas, we swept all divisions at the national competition at Clean Power. Our elementary students won. Our middle school students, they were the top innovator as far as their design. Our high school team won their competition. And K-State's collegiate team also won. So across the board, we had a great event for him, for the for the teams um, this fall at the Capitol with the governor. Um, we did a fun lunch for them. We're so proud of, of their work and how they're coming up with very unique designs. So, Again, we're trying to really um, coordinate that with our regents institutions as well as our community colleges to make sure we're, again, growing the workforce, keeping kids here, keeping them local, and taking their ideas and incorporating across our um, energy economy. So if you're interested in coming to any of those, please let me know. And I can also disseminate out what schools and school districts are sending um, kids across the state uh, to these tournaments. So a little bit about... Um, the energy we produce in the state of Kansas. So the Kansas Power Alliance, we have about 8,277 megawatts of operating projects in Kansas, about 45 projects. We have two new projects that are under construction right now as we speak, one in Marion County, one in Republic County. Uh, we have two projects that have been announced for construction. And interestingly enough, those projects are actually going to serve the ratepayers in Oklahoma because Kansas, Kansas are renewable energy assets are that inexpensive that there are um, utilities around the region that want to have access to our commodity to help lower their electric rates. So uh, Kansas renewable energy, largely in this case coming from wind, powers about 47.6% of our state, uh, of our generation portfolio. So just about half of our generation portfolio comes from wind. When you add in um, hydropower and you add in nuclear, uh, um, between 75% and 80% of our state's energy fleet um, is coming from emissions-free sources. Now, I, I think this is a really important point that we need to make right here, is um, there are different lanes in the energy sector. And so when you're talking about oil and gas, that's traditionally for um, not necessarily your lights. It's more for your vehicles and other elements of the economy. It's also for home heating. Uh, they do a lot in working in petrochemicals. So 
huge space for oil and gas. That's not necessarily our lane. We have never viewed ourselves as competitors with oil and gas. We view ourselves as a separate lane, largely providing um, you know, low cost energy to businesses and homes for electricity. And as the um, economy electri electrifies, then we can obviously assist in that. But again, we operate in different lanes. We are not competitors, in our opinion, with oil and gas. Um, about 15, those 8,000 megawatts represent about $15 billion of investment, private capital investment in the state. We don't um, have any sort of funds that come from the state of Kansas uh, to help uh, attract any of that. That's all been private investment. We bring about $22.2 million annually into local taxes, um, and that doesn't include the various donation agreements that we have with all the counties in which we operate assets. About $49 million every single year goes back directly into the pockets of our landowners and our um, host landowners and host communities. 20,000 jobs, direct and indirect. And so what are the differences between direct and indirect jobs? Direct jobs would be uh, those employees that are working specifically for the companies, whether they're doing operation and maintenance or whether or not they're doing um, engineering work or environmental work. We employ a ton of PhD individuals doing meteorology and uh, a lot of environmental work, biological work, um, soil samples and data, water work. Um, so. And then, of course, we have a lot of individuals that are um, in the space doing O and M. So, indirect jobs would be an example of we use a lot of cement, um, and so indirectly we are employing a lot of individuals in the cement space during the COVID lockdowns. Uh, when most businesses were, you know, in a, in a very challenging situation, we had three projects under construction in the state, and we were able to continue to op to stay under construction because all of our work was done outside. So we could definitely adhere to social distancing and so on and so forth. But we were able to, in those particular communities, keep restaurants open because we needed to feed our employees that were out there constructing. So we, you know, propped up a lot of different restaurants in, the, in those areas. We had different um, auto supply uh, parts where we needed to get lubricant and oil, and so we were absolutely pushing the economy that way. So lots of stories about those direct and indirect jobs. That doesn't include, of course, our Burns and Mac. Uh, Black & Veatch, Terracon, Siemens, all of those different types of companies that are here in Kansas that are working to support this industry. Uh, that 8,000 megawatts uh, is, powers about 2.6 million Kansas homes, which actually there are, that's powering more than there are Kansas homes. So we do uh, take, just like we uh, export some of our wheat and we export our beef and we export our airplanes, we do export some of our low cost generation. And that actually by exporting some of that power, it's called off-system sales. And those off-system sales help then uh, lower the cost to our particular um, consumers in the state, electric consumers in the state. We save about 15 billion gallons a year every single year um, by producing from renewables rather than thermal. Um, we, we don't use water in the cooling of generation because we're using the electricity from the wind, which is free. So that is a strong consumption or s strong savings of water consumption. And uh, yeah, I think that these statistics make Kansas, we bounce back and forth between the first and the second um, state as far as incorporation of renewable energy into its portfolio mix between us and Iowa. It kind of bounces back and forth every year. We are the fourth largest producer overall in the United States of clean energy. Oh, let's see. Sorry, I didn't mean to go back that far. Uh, this is just an, uh, a sampling of where our clean energy projects are in the state. As you can see, many states, many counties do have um, more than one renewable energy project. And what I don't have on here, and I need to update this map, is um, Johnson County, where there is a dual solar and storage project in Johnson County that is moving forward. Um, it also lists who are some of our off takers, so who buys our power. Largely the utilities buy our power. And that was largely the main driver of our early investments was the electric utilities. Why would the electric utilities want to buy our wind, buy wind power or buy solar power in Kansas? And it's the same reason why now, by far and away, the fastest growing purchaser of Kansas renewable energy are, cor are corporate and industrial customers, CNI, commercial and industrial customers, I'm sorry. 
Um, they want to buy our Kansas Renewable Energy because it's a fixed price for a long-term contract. And it's also the lowest cost generation that exists in the United States. I'm not gonna talk to you about wind power and, or clean energy in Vermont or Michigan or Tennessee or any other state, but here in Kansas, our clean energy is the lowest cost form of generation that exists. Our wind is that strong, our solar arrays are that strong that it means that we can provide the lowest cost power. Now, that's for the fuel. And so, you know, that doesn't always necessarily translate into what your utility rates are, but I can tell you that if we were not offsetting many of our fuel costs by a fixed cost coming from renewables that our utility rates would in fact be higher because we are able to offer a fixed rate at the lowest cost. Um, so that, it, that is a huge uh, attractive point for businesses and for utilities. It's a strong hedge against all future price increases. So they know what they're paying for on day one of the contract is what they're gonna pay for at the end of the contract, whether that's in year 10 or year 20 or year 25. So companies that buy Kansas Wind, aside from Evergy and some of the electric co-ops, uh, include Allianz, which is the uh, world's largest insurer, uh, Brown Foreman, which is one of the largest spirits makers in, that exists, Jack Daniels, for example, Cox Communications, Spirit, Google, Home Depot, Royal Caribbean, Kohler, Bath Plumbing Fixture Supply Company, um, of course, T-Mobile. T-Mobile, uh, all of their North American operations are powered by a project in Colby. Uh, all of Target's North American uh, operations are powered by a wind farm in Colby. All of Kohler's North American operations um, are powered by the wind farm in Marion County. So just an example of who buys. KU, K-State, Washburn, they all have entered into agreements for uh, clean power generation. It's all saving them money. In the case of Fort Hay State University in 2013, they installed just two turbines, and those two turbines help power uh, Fort Hay State University, saving the university just shy of a million dollars a year in their energy costs. So this is, this is real money, and it's the reason why um, we have companies left and right and, and private institutions and public institutions signing up for wind power or clean energy, I guess. Okay, so there's quite a bit that we can talk about here. We could, we could have a whole seminar, and I'm not gonna go down that path <laughs> with you all. But just a couple of things um, related to lesser prairie chicken, that, that is a, a big conversation, a topic of conversation. And um, for the most part, when we are building a project and, and we have a lot of biologists that do a tremendous amount of research on exact specific locations, and if we find any lesser prairie chicken lex, we either move towers um, or we do a great deal to remediate against the project. So one of the things, for example, that there was, actually this is on the eastern side of the state, so not lesser prairie chicken, but greater prairie chicken, one of the things that we know that is a big um, challenge for lesser prairie chicken in their lex, it, and the same thing for greater prairie chicken, is in, uh, encroaching cedar trees. And so on a 10,000 acre area, we went through and we remediated against um, all of those cedar trees to help, again, preserve the native intact prairie uh, and also make it a more habitat friendly place for those greater prairie chickens. So we spend a tremendous amount of time way up front uh, dealing with any sort of lesser prairie chicken. So while we are concerned about what is happening at the federal level, we also have a lot of plans in place and have done a lot of work in order to make sure that that is not as uh, detrimental of an impact for our space of the energy economy. There's conversations about eminent domain, and I wanna make it very clear to everyone in this room that for a renewable energy project, there is no power of eminent domain, absolutely none and for no elements of a clean energy project. The Kansas legislature made that policy in 2005. We've always adhered to it. We've never once challenged it. The only way we build a project in the state of Kansas if there are four things. You have to have willing landowners, first and foremost. Must have willing landowners. There is no right of eminent domain. You have to have a quality, um, a, a quality commodity, which we do in Kansas across our state. You have to have access to transmission. 
and you have to have a power purchase off taker. If you don't have any four of those things, you have to have all four of those things. And if you don't have one of them, project does not move forward. So I want to make that very clear. Now, there's a difference. That is for the projects themselves and any of the lines and substations for those specific projects. Now, there are transmission lines that are built across the state of Kansas, and those are built for system reliability. They're built to move power. We're part of a 14 state region, and so transmission lines are built to provide system reliability. Transmission lines go through a very robust process at the Kansas Corporation Commission to become a public utility. And with that public utility status comes the right of eminent domain. So while, while nothing is done on a landowner's ground related to a clean energy project, there is a difference when it comes to building electric transmission. Now here's another little category. We also have what's called generator lead lines. Picture, your, picture a lamp at your house. So you have your lamp, and think of the lamp as the wind farm, and then you've got the place to plug it in, which you know, would be the electric grid. So you've got your wind farm here, you need to plug it into the grid, and so you have to have some sort of generator lead line or cord to where you plug in uh, the power to the grid. Those lines do not have the right of eminent domain. Those lines all must be privately negotiated with willing landowners or else that generator lead line does not cross their ground, period. And that's very important. I, wanna, I just want to make sure that everyone understands that. There is a large transmission line. There are several transmission lines being built in the state of Kansas. One, both of them have the right of eminent domain. Eminent domain, when used, is 100% a last resort. More often than not, if eminent domain is being used, it's being used because we cannot find the landowner or the landowner will not communicate with the company. So it is 100% used as a last resort. Eminent domain proceedings and the process of notification can take 18 to 24 months. So if, uh, if anyone was to come and tell you that out of the blue, a company was going to come in and try and take their ground using eminent domain for a transmission line or for a clean energy project. It is definitely not the case if it's a clean energy project. Definitely not the case. No right of eminent domain. If it's for a transmission line, which would be on the utility side, they are not coming in under the cover of darkness. There has been a very long well-documented process, and whether or not they've chosen to engage in that process, can't speak to that. But uh, if you do ever have any questions about eminent domain, please let me know, because we take this very seriously, uh, just as far as how we interact with our communities. We will not come to your community if we are not welcome. So we can spend a tremendous amount of time talking about how we site projects, how we work with the military to site projects. We can talk about how we move projects to market, um, and about transmission and Kansas's role in Southwest Power Pool. We know that currently um, on any given day, about half of our wind power is stranded in the state of Kansas because we do not have the transmission system that's robust enough to move that power to market. That's a real challenge. That's causing harm to our uh, landowners who some of their agreements actually say that they get a, a, a portion of production. So they're not getting you know, what it is that they um, thought that they were going to receive from a financial standpoint. Josh and I spend a tremendous amount of time talking about the Inflation Reduction Act. Right or wrong, it is the law of the land. It is fundamentally changing the energy economy. And there are um, a tremendous amount of um, investments and opportunities associated with the IRA. So we spend a lot of time talking with our local governments and our counties, kind of giving them a what to expect when you're expecting presentation about what it means when infrastructure is going to be built in your community. And Josh, I don't know, do you want to talk a little bit about the FIDA? Actually, yeah, and I may take um, just a moment. I'm more than happy to talk a little bit about 
Blade recycling, that's a question that we get a good deal of questions about, or that's an issue we get a good deal of questions about. What is Kansas doing relating to blade recycling? We're actually leading the United States in, in how we're, we've not had any blades come down that have not been addressed. So there are no blades in Kansas that are in landfills. We have had some, we've had a handful of blades come down that have been replaced. We're using those as bridges. We are grinding them up and we're using them in flooring. Um, we are actually doing a lot of research with NREL related to how we take the blades themselves and, um, and just make the coating more recyclable so that blades can be recycled more frequently and more easily. Uh, I did a, a podcast with Representative Propes and we spent more than an hour talking about blade recycling, which is kind of interesting, so if you don't have anything else to do. Um, light mitigation is an interesting discussion and we're working on a piece of legislation right now in the Senate that would require um, all new wind farms prospectively to apply to the FAA for this new technology related to light mitigation. So the red blinking lights uh, that you see at night. So for a long, so that is all designated by the um, FAA. The, F the FAA says where towers can be placed in, in the United States and in the state of Kansas, and they determine uh, the synchronization of those red blinking lights. So technology is finally come to fruition and has been approved by the FAA that would allow us to install light mitigation technology. So prospectively, we're looking at a bill that would require all new wind farms, and we're also looking at a bill that says retroactively. This comes with a $100 million price tag that we will take on. Retroactive, all wind farms, at the time of a new contract um, agreement, then we seek application with the FAA to install light mitigation technology. Um, so it's about $100 million to retrofit all of our existing projects in Kansas, and it comes with each particular project is about $100,000 to $150,000 in annual operation and maintenance. And that's something that we're trying to do prospectively and proactively to demonstrate the technology now exists, it's available, and we want to be a really good neighbor. Um, Real quick, and there's some of you that have heard this presentation, and I'll stop here. We talked a little bit about how the system, we're not able to move all of our energy to market. And that's not a great thing for our communities. That's not a great thing for the companies. It's not a great thing for the landowners. So we're working every single day to figure out how do we maximize the system? What do we need to do to get more power to market? First is we need to build more transmission. And building more transmission does nothing but ensure we have a more reliable electric grid. And it also um, ensures that we can move power more smoothly across the entire region. So during Winter Storm Uri, the reason why we didn't end up like Texas is because we have a lot of interconnection points between our 14 states, where Texas is just one state, we're 14 states, but also because we have interconnection points with different grids around the United States. And so at one point, we were importing 6,000 megawatts of power into this region in order to support our grid. We were importing. The, the only way you import is by having a robust transmission grid. So again, it, the grid keeps things safe and keeps things reliable, and then it also helps power move um, more slowly and more efficiently, which only means lower cost um, rates to, your, to customers and ratepayers. So the other thing that we're seeking to do um, in trying to maximize the system, we talk a lot about battery storage, we talk about EV charging, uh, we talk about data centers as new batteries. We talk about nitrogen fertilizer, which Josh spends a tremendous amount of time on. And we are also talking about um, a hydrogen hub endeavor. And so there are some of you that have heard me talk a little bit about the hydrogen hub endeavor that we're um, embarking upon. And we're doing this in tandem with a tremendous number of businesses and industries across the state of Kansas in tandem with the geological survey. So the federal government, through the IRA, uh, created a new program, it's called an Earthshot program, where they are seeking to bring between six and ten hubs across the United States uh, to create a hydrogen economy. Actually, I'm going to skip these slides real quick. A hydrogen economy. So this is kind of what it might look like, I think, from DOE's perspective, where hubs might be, generally speaking. And uh, 
we decided, there was kind of a group of us that decided that we would take the step to make application to be a part of this Earthshot program because of our strategic advantages, our competitive resources, make Kansas a very compelling state to participate in this hub program. So we um, sought uh, grant funding through the summer to do a lot of engineering work and a lot of scientific work to pull together um, an initial concept paper. We were one of 79 applicants to uh, the Department of Energy for this hydrogen hub program. We actually, on December 28th, did receive encouragement from DOE to take the next step as it relates to the hydrogen hub effort. So between now and April 7th, we will prepare um, a more than 150 page application document that's very detailed engineering and scientific talking about all sorts of different things related to what the hydrogen economy could bring to the state of Kansas, what uh, our hydrogen what our hydrogen hub would bring to the United States and how it would benefit uh, both the state and the U.S. So we were thrilled to have received encouragement. Uh, our hydrogen hub proposal, again, focuses on our competitive advantages, and also we're seeking to be one of the six to ten selections. So we did have to make some strategic decisions in um, what we chose. Our hub program largely fe features um, hydrogen stemming from nuclear generation, hydrogen made from uh, our renewable generation that we have excess capacity of. It also features uh, creation of the nation's strategic hydrogen reserve, kind of similar to the nation's strategic petroleum reserve, a little less political, uh, definitely more probably like the nation's strategic helium reserve. Uh, we also do have what we call uh, the blue hydrogen, which blue hydrogen is made from oil and gas. We know that several of the other larger hubs in the United States are aggressively pursuing blue hydrogen endeavors, and very few of them are doing anything in the areas that where we're looking at. So we feel that we're covering the color wheel in hydrogen, but uh, we're also um, looking at some of our most strong competitive advantages. So we're very enthusiastic about that. Um, we will make that application on April 7th. We've asked for a portion of $686,000 um, from Spark to help us with the front end, uh, front end engineering design to help us pay for that. We're also seeking philanthropic money and money from private industry to help us get to that 686. Once we make that application to DOE, we'll have about a year where we wait um, and as DOE continues to vet through all of the different projects. We're competing against um, two large hub proposals in Texas, a big hub proposal in, uh, called HALO, Hydrogen, Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, a group called Mach 2, which is kind of the Illinois, um, Appalachia area. Uh, there's, there, are private, there are private companies specifically in, in different portions of the United States. So it is a very robust competition. We're very enthusiastic, though, about our positioning and, and where Kansas will end up. Uh, oh, we don't even want to talk about that. But that is our timeline, just so you all can see what, what we're talking about. Our application has made a request from the federal government, um, all of which has to be privately matched. Our request is about $1.2 billion, specifically to build infrastructure, largely to, do, um, to, to buy an electrolysis unit, one electrolysis unit, to build out some pipeline, and then to do a lot of... Um, uh, studies and to build up our caverns to handle that strategic hydrogen reserve. Again, that 1.2 billion would be privately matched, and we believe through economic analysis that that 1.2 billion would turn into an initial 5.9 billion dollar investment in the state by 2030. So, that's all. What questions can I answer? <laughs> But I'm really happy to get to be here to talk to you guys about this space. This is not, I try not to ever ask for anything. We just kind of like to go out and do our work quietly. So I appreciate to get the chance to be in front of appropriations. Well, thank you for being here and, and we'll open up for questions. Um, first, I want to make a comment about the Cloud County Community College WIND program. Um, actually, my cousin benefited from that program and he's a graduate from that program and he currently works at a wind farm in Ellsworth County. So he was able to stay in the region and stay close to home. I do know that when he was in the program, he was already being approached with jobs before he graduated. And they have taken some of the students out um, and given them job offers. And they haven't completed the program. It's a very, um, it's a, a very unique program. And 
and it's in Representative Kincannon's <laughs> district. So I just had to mention that <laughs> as well. Um, going back to the topic of eminent domain, mm -hmm. and that was one thing that I had specifically mm -hmm. asked for because it has been coming up uh, quite frequently in my district um, due to the, the transmission line from the Grain Belt Express. Right. Um, I would say resurfacing uh, because back in 2013 it was coming about and then it kind of halted because of the other states that were involved in the transmission line between Kansas and Indiana. Yes. Um, and then it has been uh, purchased or there's been a, mm -hmm. uh, I guess what the best word is, a, uh, another company is looking at a, uh, producing that transmission line or constructing that transmission line. And so there's been a lot of questions that I've had from constituents in regards to the approach and the status of the eminent domain with the Grain Belt Express because so much time has elapsed um, from 2013 or 2012 when they first got the status of eminent domain. And uh, so could you kind of just explain that? Absolutely, and that's a really good question. Um, so Grain Belt Express is an 800 mile transmission line and it actually uh, connects multiple different our, um, regional transmission organizations. It would take 5,000 megawatts of Kansas generation largely synced in the Dodge City area. And it would move that power from Kansas, across Kansas, to a drop point in Missouri, and then to another drop point up in Indiana. The project would be built in two phases, the first phase being the Kansas-Missouri leg, and the second phase being um, Missouri on into Indiana. And as the chairman said, that project uh, was initially announced in, honestly, the 2011 timeframe. It needed to go through the application process at the Kansas Corporation Commission to become a public utility, which can be anywhere from a nine to 18 month process. They did uh, seek application, they did successfully uh, they were granted public utility status in the state, which then did grant them the right of eminent domain. The project was moving forward and moving forward quickly, but then they ran into a significant roadblock in Missouri. And that roadblock has been there um, basically for seven, almost eight years. And so at that, so in the 2020 timeframe, a different company um, purchased the, the rights to Grain Belt Express but they had to go back before the Kansas Corporation Commission and re-up all of the authorities that had been previously granted. So the, what, the authority that existed didn't transfer immediately. It had, they had to go back through the process and regain um, all of their statuses and, and, and make you know, formal filings and applications to the Kansas Corporation Commission. Uh, the KCC did sign off on that, and that was in, again, like the 2020 timeframe. And uh, at the same time, that particular project uh, developer, which is one of the largest um, energy companies in the United States, American-owned energy company in the United States, uh, was also working through the process um, in Missouri as well. And there, there were some court cases and legal challenges, and in every case, um, the project ended up uh, receiving green lights, if you will. And there still are a tremendous number of off takers that are very interested in the project and the process. So it it has now received everything that it needs to move forward for phase one of the project. So that is again, the Kansas to Missouri element. So the 5,000 um, megawatts of Kansas wind power is about a $10 billion economic opportunity for our state. It's a really big deal. And it's largely gonna be based in Southwest Kansas. Um, on the Kansas to Missouri portion, not all, 86% uh, of the land negotiations that have been gone through to this point have gone through um, with no problem. Not every landowner, they're moving from the western portion of the state to the eastern portion of the state, so not the whole state has been a, a talked to from a, I guess from a land acquisition standpoint. Uh, but in all of the conversations thus far, um, I think in Kansas, it's more than 90% that have gone favorably, no problem, all willing landowners signing. There have been um, some instances, and I have you know, all the documentation where landowners have either not engaged at all, can't be found, or not engaged uh, with the company, uh, and so then they're having to go through the process of eminent domain in the state. I don't know if you have any, you have another specific question? Josh. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Josh Maswati with the Advanced Power Alliance. I, I just want to step in quickly and help understand when we say can't be found, it's not a, oh, we didn't go out and try to find this person. What usually happens is that there is a fee estate that's been passed down multiple generations and maybe someone didn't have a will a generation ago and so they had 10 kids and then they had 10 kids. And so then it's, it's owned in part by like literally 20 people and you would have to get signatures by all 20 people and you simply cannot find them. That's typically what eminent domain is used for. That's not to say that uh, you can have a landowner that's like, no, I really don't want this crossing my property. And, and eventually, uh, you have to go to an arbitrated eminent domain situation. But typically, it's used because when we say we can't find them, uh, the, the particular parcel in question is owned by innumerable people. Uh, the only other thing I would add, sorry, is that um, uh, generally when they routed the Grain Belt Express, they followed as much as possible existing rights of way for existing transmission lines. So there's already transmission lines that are there. This will be bigger, uh, but there are already large transmission lines in place. Sorry. Well, I'm kind of glad you mentioned the, the uh, arbitration that can go through if a landowner does not want the transmission line on their land because I have a constituent who has a commercial winery, horse ranch, does not want the transmission line on her ranch because it will impede on her commercial business. And now this is hearsay, but she told me that the landowners next to her are more than welcome to have the transmission lines and to be paid for it. Um, so I didn't know how that all worked out, but I'm, so I'm glad you mentioned the arbitration that can go through if you do not want the transmission line on your piece of property. Yeah, and that is very well spelled out in statute as far as what that arbitration process looks like and um, any sort of compensation if the project, if, if it actually moved into an eminent domain scenario. So very well spelled out in statute. And it, and it is difficult because as Josh said, um, so adjustments are always made during the siting process at the Kansas Corporation Commission. So you can, you can adjust for, but um, this project and the line itself and the siting of the project um, actually, there, there really weren't the challenges to the siting at the time. And so now it's, it, now, you know, as, as it's moved forward, we're kind of hearing some more things. I know in the specific case of that, that landowner, it's difficult because there's already transmission running across our property. And I know, I mean, I know you don't want to look at more. I get that. I absolutely get that. Um, it's, it's always challenging. I, that's why we do a lot of the presentations to the counties. Like I said, what to expect when you're expecting because infrastructure is not easy. It's not easy, and county leaders and local leaders have to work with their communities and work with landowners, um, some of whom are going to have to look directly at whether it's a transmission line or a new you know, pipeline or, you know, frankly, a new anything, a new road of some, some sense. Those are very difficult things to deal with, and we get that. All right. Thank you. Representative Estes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the interest of time, could I just ask a series of questions and let them email them back? That's fine, yes. Thank you. Um, what do you know from inception how much the uh, state of Kansas has given the wind industry up until today? Um, of the Cloud County students, do you know how many are working in Kansas? Um, and in terms of dollar amounts, last for each of the three last years, how much uh, wind energy was exported outside of Kansas? And lastly, how do you define community and how do you determine that a community welcomes you? Uh, I can answer those actually really quickly if that's okay. Um, it's up to the chairman. I know we're running on time. Sure, as far as the state dollars, zero. The state has never contributed uh, a penny to, the, to growing this industry and that's fine. We've never asked for any funding from the state. How many workers that have uh, come out of the Cloud County Community College program that are actually working in Kansas? I can ask Cloud County. I'm not sure if they track that data. We also have, uh, we do a lot of work with other tech colleges and community colleges around the state, so I'm not sure. But I can see if they can answer that question. Um, when it comes to exporting, so that's, that's, a, that's an interesting question because when you think of um, power and electrons. So it all just goes into one big pool. So whether it's coal, nuclear, natural gas, wind, uh, it all goes into one big 14 state pool. And so, I mean, 
Yes, on paper, it may look like it's being exported, but in all reality, electrons always take the path of least resistance and they're gonna be used locally for like as close as to home as possible. So on paper, there may be exporting, um, but we're also, it's also a part of this 14 state grid. And so I guess the question becomes, are we exporting, if we're exporting within the grid, where we also import power from. So we're adding electrons to that grid to keep that grid nice and stable as well. So hope that answers that question. And then, um, I'm sorry, the fourth was, um, oh, how do we define community and uh, whether or not uh, community is welcome? Uh, so there we have, we work with landowners early, early, early on uh, up front. If there are landowners that don't, want to sign, then they, they don't sign. Uh, generally speaking, there's been one project where uh, the county commission decided that on a two to one vote that they did not wanna permit the project and that was the county's prerogative. We've, we've always uh, supported the Wabunsee versus Zimmerman decision in, from 2010 that, that gives the right to the counties as far as where projects are cited and how. So we always have to have willing landowners. We need to have the support of communities. Um, if, if there's not the community support, there's not willing landowners, then the project won't be built. I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. Answer all your questions. It, it did. Do we have time for a quick comment? Yes. Okay, so, and, and that last one is one I struggle with because I want to empower a willing landowner to do what they want with their property, but you have neighbors who feel negative impacts, and that's why I wanted to know how do you find community, because one could argue, because you said, you know, we don't go if the community doesn't welcome us, but a community is a group of people and while a willing landowner may welcome you, their neighbor may not. So I wanted to reconcile what you're saying. So, and that, that's a very interesting question and it's an important question. It, you know, in part goes back to private property rights and that, you know, landowners can, that's something that we hold very dear in the state of Kansas is that, pri you know, private property rights are, are just that. You can do on your land what you want to do on your land. When a, a project comes to the state of Kansas, in the case of a wind farm, these are thousands of acres. And so you, you're touching a lot of different landowners and they all have to be willing to participate it, and understanding that there might be a landowner or a couple of landowners within that project footprint that, that might not want to participate. And that's difficult because then they're not gonna be participating and they'll still be looking at the turbines. They won't be getting any of the money. But that's also their prerogative. Um, they can't necessarily say what should or shouldn't happen on other landowners' land. And that's, that is a challenge. I know we always talk about Josh's grandfather, who there was a, a company that approached them about putting uh, cell towers on his ground, and he said, you know, absolutely not. I don't want to look at those god-awful things. And so the, the company went literally right across 156. And there's three towers that have three red blinking lights uh, that blink. Well, actually, there's nine lights that blink at different levels all the time. And he gets to look at them now, but he doesn't have any of the money associated with it. So there, it's not to say that, that there's ever 100% consensus for anything. I would never presume to say that. But where projects are built is where there is a strong, strong majority consensus of, of landowners that want to see a project move forward. And if that doesn't exist, then the project won't happen. Representative Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, one of the one of the projects going in is on Western Johnson, Eastern Douglas. Um, I had said I'd support that so long as no eminent domain was used. So far, everything is hunky dory. I've heard rumors, however, uh, that for a transmission line, eminent domain is being used, and I don't know if this if this rumor was based in fact or based in fear. And so I thought now would be an excellent time to ask. Huh. No, yeah. that's a great question. Uh, so I can find out the specifics if for West Gardner Solar there is any new transmission that's needed for that project. So I think there's probably two questions. One, if it's just a, if it's just a smaller generation lead line to connect the project to the grid, no eminent domain. 
Um, I, I don't know at this time of any transmission that's needed in that particular area specifically for that project because then it would go through a huge process at the Southwest Power Pool. Uh, so I'll do some asking. But if it is an actual transmission line, then they would have the right of eminent domain. But I don't know of any transmission specifically built for this particular project or for that particular project. No right of eminent domain. Okay. So I'm going to take a pretty dim view if we, if we are at that point. Uh, using when we say we only use eminent domain as a last resort only if you don't want it is well that, that's uh, and kind of rubs against the property rights that we are so fond of and a transmission line an actual transmission line that planning process can be set you know five to seven to ten years and is all driven by Southwest Power Pool so it's not driven by projects an actual transmission line needed for the grid. So I'm more than happy to ask Southwest Power Pool if there are any transmission, new transmission lines proposed for that area that are have nothing to do with that particular project. Excellent. I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any further questions for Kimberly or Josh? Representative Turk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, quick question. What percentage of your projects are subsidized by a federal government or any government entity at all? Kimberly. Uh, so every form of, of generation in the United States of America, whether it's clean energy or oil and gas, coal, nuclear, they all have some sort of federal subsidy. And so um, in the case of Kansas projects, there is no state subsidy. There has been a federal production tax credit that lasted for 10 years, and that tax credit was based on production. So unlike other forms of generation that just have the tax credits or other tax incentives, ours is only received if you are producing. So there is no there is no exploration tax credit. It's a production tax credit. It's about two point it's about two point three cents per kilowatt hour, uh, based on production. Yeah, Turk. So if all subsidies were to go away tomorrow, would you guys still continue to build these projects? Absolutely. Our the projects are. The renewable generation uh, availability in the state of Kansas is so strong that uh, previously you could look at power uh, agreements in the seven to eight cents a kilowatt hour through research and development and onshoring a lot of manufacturing. That price has now count, come down to under a cent a kilowatt hour under a cent a kilowatt hour. So even if you were to remove any sort of federal incentive or federal production tax credit, which is 2.3 cents, that's still 3.3 3 .3 cents a kilowatt hour or so, which makes us still incredibly economic and affordable for ratepayers and for commercial and industrial customers. Representative Turk. Yeah, thank you. One more. Uh, so I didn't see any reference to the I guess the optimization map that came out from the U.S. Geological Survey measuring wind throughout the state of Kansas, what showing what counties are optimal and, and not optimal, it's, you know, not optimal being red, et cetera, yellow being medium, green being great. What counties that are in that suboptimal level are being looked at for future projects? Kimberly. So the state of Kansas, we are considered the Saudi Arabia of wind. So we have a tremendous resource across the state of Kansas. Uh, I can, there are states in the United States, like the southeast, some states in the northeast, where their wind is nothing like ours. Just like if they were to try and grow wheat, it would be nothing like ours. So our, our competitive advantage is the fact that we have a lot of wind in our state. It blows hard and it blows often. So you can build any project in the state of Kansas and have it basically be the lowest cost form of generation. There are some portions of our state where, from state policy, they've made the decision that we are not going to build in, this, in that particular area. The Flint Hills is a tremendous area. It has a wonderful wind resource. It has access to transmission. But there, is, there are 18 counties where all or a portion of of those counties are off limits for development. But you could build anywhere in the state of Kansas and have it be the lowest cost form of generation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any other further questions for Kimberly or Josh? All right, seeing none, okay. thank you for being thank here today. Um, committee, you'll also notice that you have a couple of reports that have been distributed out to uh, the committee members. The first is from Wichita State University's National Institute for Aviation Research Program, and the second is the Kansas Board of Emergency Medical Services. So please take a look at those reports at your leisure. Until tomorrow morning, uh, we are adjourned until 9 a.m.